Our next speaker this afternoon is a graduate of Stanford University with a master's degree in communication. She has, had devo uh, she has devoted her documentary film, television, radio, writing, and reporting career to productions concerning science, medicine, and the environment. She has received local, national, and international awards, including three regional Emmys, a national Emmy nomination, and a WCVB, that's very hard to say, by the way, Boston Station Peabody Award for Medical and Scientific Programming. I'm now, that's, that's it, I'm, now I'm diverting from your bio, okay. <laughs> um, remember I talked about the giants, we stand on their shoulders, the, our next speaker is one of those giants, okay? You can only imagine what her bio looks like. It's very long. All right. If you turn on the television and watch any UFO program, you're going to see her, okay? If you listen to the radio about UFO programs, you're going to hear her. Um, and you might see or hear her on other topics as well. She's all over the place, all over the planet, talking about these things. You might think that she likes a lot of attention, but <laughs> that's not it. That's not it, I'm telling you, that's not it. Like I talked about earlier, this is one of those things is when this gets inside of you, you're done. You're compelled to be involved in this phenomenon. Um, we could not have recruited a person into this science more perfectly suited uh, to do this work than our next speaker. Um, a brilliant communicator. Uh, a, a brilliant person, uh, technically, scientifically, and has the ability to talk about these things all over the planet. But I can tell you how this probably happened for her. Okay, and I, after I'm done, you can go, oh, you just made that up. All right. That's that moment. It's this quintessential moment when, um, when you have that epiphany and you have to make a decision. And for her, I imagine that it happened in a cow pasture. Okay. <laughs> Former Miss Idaho, standing in a cow pasture, looking at a mutilated cow carcass, <laughs> and in this moment realizing that what she was looking at could not have been caused by human means. Your brain was rewired, all the hair on your body stood on end, and you got all the little goosebumps. And then you probably did one of these kind of like, where you suddenly realize that whatever alien force did this to this animal might still be lurking about. And you kind of look around creepily like somebody's watching you. And in that moment, she had two choices to make. Run like hell out of the cow field, never go back, convince yourself that what you saw was normal predators or whatever the case may be, and hope that the nightmares stop someday, okay? Go into denial. That's one choice. The other choice is continue down the rabbit hole, okay? Take the red pill. And for the rest of your life, every single day, try and find the truth, and in her case, because of her talents, tell the rest of us about it in a very, very concise and professional way. Okay. Well, thank God she took the red pill. She went down the rabbit hole because I don't think there's anybody in the business that has ever uh, been a louder, longer, stronger voice for the truth and for the questions that need to be asked for us to broaden our understanding of this universe. Okay, it's the questions that drive us. That's four matrix references in one introduction. <laughs> Not everybody can do that. Okay. <laughs> now, we also have a little treat um, for you, Linda. Well, our next speaker doesn't need that much of an introduction. You know about the book she's written. You know about the documentary video she's done. You know about the award she's won. I hope you know that she's got a new book coming out shortly called uh, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness which you will all want to get, I assure you. And now she has the title of being the only speaker here to be here every year. Sorry, Antonio, you shouldn't have gone to Costa Rica. Uh, so, with great pleasure, as always, here's Linda.
there's something special about making that trek all the way from someplace in the United States to get to Eureka Springs that makes this such a special conference, I think. Wouldn't you agree that Lou has done a really fine job now? Yes, he has. Now, this is the honest to God truth. That's the longest introduction that Lou ever gave Linda. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. It's true. Linda Moulton now. Oh, for us, everyone, thank you. I always feel when I'm at Eureka Springs that there are some of us who have been on this path for, this is the 30th year, and uh, I missed one, so 29 here for me. And when I think back to the very first one, we were in the real hot investigative mystery and fever of Gulf Breeze and what was happening with Ed Walters. And I still think of Eureka Springs as being a moment when there, everything came together in a room over here in the Ozark Inn there was a retired Air Force guy. He came up and he whispered in my ear and he said, would you like to meet Ed Walters? And it was all a big mystery then and when everybody had seen the photographs of the craft in the sky and the beams and nobody knew he was here. He never let anybody know that year he was here, but I stayed up all night with the retired Air Force guy and Ed Walters hearing what had really happened to Ed Walters. And almost like Kathy Marden's sad and unbelievable story about what happened to the astronomer McDonald, who was basically driven out of a professional life with a keen mind who knew that we were not dealing with inversions. Ed Walters was drummed out of his life and his family broke up when, I, as far as I'm concerned, the attack was the same kind of attack on Ed Walters as there was on McDonald and so many people. The government has played very, very, very hardball. I have never, ever shared with the public everything that I went through in the 80s. But I am here today with a with a feeling that we are finally close to at least the worldwide headlines that we're not alone in this universe. And Grant is going to talk tonight, and Grant and I and a few others are trying to stay closely hooked together on what may be real heartbeats, and that all of us who have been coming here for a very long time knowing pieces of the story and of the evidence, including, yes, those bloodless, trackless animals where my story began, and having law enforcement look into my eyes and say, Linda, the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. That's what law enforcement said back in the 70s, based on their experiences from the 60s onward. And before I start into my formal presentation, I'd just like this audience to know how many sheriffs, how many deputies knew, saw, many of them even saw beams of light with animals either rising in the beam or lowered to the ground. I've talked with ranchers who would never, under any circumstances, stand up in front of my camera or even go later on the record in a recording for radio. But they are honest people, and I have sat in their homes, and I have looked in their eyes, and they have told me about seeing an animal rising or lowering in a beam of light on their ranch they were terrified and wanted to wait until the sun came up before they went out and there would be a mutilated animal. As a reporter, without having the law enforcement and those people go on the record, it's difficult. 
because then I become a translator as opposed to a reporter. But remember, no matter what it is that is announced, whether it's microbes on Mars, swimming creatures in Enceladus, just remember that there were law enforcement and ranchers in the 60s who saw beams of light coming out of disks in the sky and saw animals rise in those beams and lower it. Never forget that data point. And now I'm going to go to something that actually excites me. In the past 30 years, the subjects here have woven their way through the Ozark Conference. And they began with those bloodless, trackless animal mutilations, UFOs, Sasquatch, human abductions, crop formations. And today, in addition to those phenomena, there are many new questions coming from astrophysicists such as, how many universes are there beyond this one? How many different dimensions echo from each universe like notes in a chord of music? Keep that as I go through. A chord of music. We could be simultaneously a note in this universe in a chord of universes. Is there a fixed timeline from the alpha to the omega as Albert Einstein himself hypothesized? If that were true, how could we have free will? Or are there as many different timelines as there are other universes and dimensions? And would any exist if there weren't minds and souls with consciousness creating simulations of different universes for different reasons. That question, is the universe a simulation, was debated before a sold out, packed audience one year ago in April on the 5th in 2016 at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. The moderator was astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson. Across the Atlantic Ocean, the UK's Daily Mail headlined, Are we living in a computer game? Some physicists and mathematicians say the answer is more likely to be yes than not, and that eventually the simulated universe theory will even be proved. The scientists on that stage in New York included from far left the moderator and astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson, director of New York City's Hayden Planetarium, philosopher David Chalmers, theoretical physicist Lisa Randall from Harvard University wearing sunglasses. To her right was James Gates, theoretical physicist of supersymmetry and superstring theory at the University of Maryland in College Park, and then cosmologist Max Tegmark, from MIT, and the far-right theoretical physicist Zora Davudi, also from MIT. Some scientists and mathematicians are trying to see if the mathematical rules that govern our universe, such as Planck's constant and E equals mc squared, can be replicated. Can humans find replications? If they can, then it is at least possible to simulate a universe like this one. Panelist James Gate, he's PhD, he's professor of theoretical physics, researching supersymmetry and superstring theory at the University of Maryland, College Park. He asked, how could we discover whether we live inside of a matrix and he suggests, quote, try to detect the presence of codes in the laws that describe physics. When he looked in supersymmetry equations, Dr. Gates was surprised that he does find codes commonly used 
to remove errors in computer transmissions to make computer browsers work on this planet today. Professor Gates asked, quote, why were those codes in the equations that I was studying about quarks and leptons and supersymmetry? They could even be embedded in the essence of our reality. If this is the case, we might have something in common with the Matrix science fiction films, which depict a world where everything human beings experience is the product of a virtual reality generating computer network, close quote. The Matrix, the original 1999 movie, depicts an Earth future dominated by robots in this century, the 21st century, and that the robots rebel against the homo sapiens sapien that are ordering them around. The robots in the Matrix forced human minds under control by cybernetic implants that connect to a simulated virtual reality that they called the Matrix, that humans could not distinguish from the actual baseline reality. Physicist John Archibald Wheeler, born 1911 and died 2008, was an American theoretical physicist at Princeton University, best known for linking black holes to cosmic objects in gravitational collapse and for the simulated universe concept, he was the first, and he called it, it from bit. He was the first. He compared the universe to bits in a computer program in which everything from quarks to galaxies to humans are a zero and one information system. And here is his very famous original quote. The it from bit principle symbolizes the idea that every item of the physical world has at bottom an immaterial source and explanation. Think of all of us have been exposed to the idea that the only reason that our flesh hits with the wood and we call it solid that if we moved Planck's constant one tiny decimal point, my hand would go right through this. There would be, it would be all energy from our point of view. So we're on this tiny, tiny, thin line with Planck's constant, that the distance between the atoms, the protons, the quarks, the distance between them in what we call the atom is just precise through the universe so that this basically large, spacious thing between the atoms can interact because we're in a universe in which Planck's constant is that fine, just a tiny move and we would not have solidity. And so, that which we call, continuing with Wheeler, that which we call reality arises in the last analysis from the posing of yes, no, plus or minus questions, and the registering of equipment evoked responses, meaning all things physical are information theoretic in origin. And this is a participatory universe, close quote. Consciousness affects what happens when they try to study atoms. At the Recode Code Computer Conference in Los Angeles, California, on June 1st, 2016, one speaker was Elon Musk, owner and CEO of SpaceX and Tesla. He was asked about the simulated universe hypothesis and he said, quote, the odds that we're in a base reality is one in billions, close quote, meaning that Elon Musk thinks that the odds are high that we are in a simulated universe. Further, Elon Musk said, quote, 40 years ago, we had Pong, two rectangles and a dot. That's where we were. 
Now, 40 years later, we have photorealistic 3D simulations with millions of people playing simultaneously in these black box generations, and it's getting better, better every year. And soon, we'll have virtual reality. If you assume any rate of improvement at all, then the games will become indistinguishable from reality." Close quote. And that's why Elon Musk and others from Silicon Valley hypothesize that what we humans think is reality is actually an advanced intelligence's giant computer simulation. So what evidence is there that we are living in a simulation matrix? First, artificial intelligence to build robots is right now using human brain mapping. Also, virtual reality headsets are being developed to put people anywhere the virtual reality software creators manipulate zeros and ones. Reinforcing the hypothesis that our universe is a computer simulation are the underlying math rule sets behind everything. Rules include the speed of light at 186,000 miles a second, NASA Jet Propulsion Lab scientist Rich Terrell says, the universe does behave mathematically from the subatomic to the macro. Quote, it is broken up into pieces of subatomic particles like a pixelated video game. Even things that we think of as continuous, like time, energy, space, volume, they all mathematically have finite, finite limit to their size. And if that's the case, then our universe is both computable and finite. Those properties allow the universe to be simulated, close quote. So if our universe is a computer simulation, who or what created the simulation. In 2007, at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, I met Jerry and Kathy Wills, who have been leading expeditions to what Aymara natives of Peru and Bolivia call Oramamuru, or Puerta do Hayumarca, which means doorway to the lands of the gods and immortal life. The doorway of Aramamuru is about halfway between the Yave district to the northwest and Huli to the southeast. Local Aymara natives in Peru and Bolivia revere the mysterious ancient carved rock door and say it is where life was first created on Earth. The solid rock doorway is said to lead to another dimension, and they have a word for it, and it is dimension. Many Peruvians and Bolivians are afraid to be near the Aramamuru doorway because locals claim that some people have appeared coming through the solid rock door and then later disappeared going back into the rock door. Some even say that they have seen strange, very tall men with glowing balls of light walk out of the solid rock door. Remember, it isn't a door that swings on hinges. It is the rectangle of a door. And just to orient you, because it's very interesting, this is 23 feet here to where this man is standing. This has been measured. I don't have the final, but it's about uh, Jerry Will says he thinks it's six foot three to six foot six. Now he's six foot nine. He had to get down. So I think his estimate of six foot th three to six is probably pretty close. This is a man that uh, had been in there when this photographer took this photo, not Jerry, but it's showing. And the reason why I'm taking some time. This is where the shamans, for really centuries is a fair word, this is what they refer to as the Aramamuru. And this is the bigger door. And nobody 
not in mythology, not in villages passing. Nobody knows how or why the 23-foot door was carved around this door. And the natives who have seen people come through this rock have seen them always coming through the six to six and a half foot tall door. And they have seen them appear coming through with a flash of light or going into the rock with a flash of light. And then if they're coming out, they look like they are in ancient Inca dress, as if something is mimicking something from long, long ago. Now here is Jerry. It, he's not in the doorway, but you can tell he is a tall, lanky man. And on November 11th, 1998, at 11 p.m. in the evening, Jerry and his wife, Kathy, were newlyweds, and Jerry was at the solid rock Aramamura doorway because he had been trying to understand his own strange life and strange places that he was attracted to, specifically in Peru. His whole life he's been attracted to Peru. Jerry was born an orphan in 1953, and he was left to die alone in a cold Kentucky farmhouse. And miraculously, he was rescued by people who stumbled into this farmhouse and was adopted by a Kentucky family who had a farm. In 1965, at age 12 and a half, on a cold fall day, Jerry was stacking wood at sundown when a silver aerial disc appeared over some tall pine trees Large, pale lights pulsed one after the other around the UFO, going in one direction and then reversing in a slow, steady pulse. There was no wind, but the tops of the pine trees whipped back and forth as if the silver UFO was emitting some kind of energy, and we've all heard that. It can be a completely still day. And a disc comes, treetop, and the trees are doing this. In his mind, Jerry Wills heard a telepathic thought voice from whoever was in the silver craft saying that these unseen visitors would return to meet Jerry again in the future. A year later, in July 1966, Jerry was face to face with a tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, extraterrestrial male named Zoe. Zoe said he was from a humanoid civilization on a planet orbiting the star Tau Ceti, about 12, 12 light years from Earth. Here's us, here's Tau Ceti, 12 light years. You hear a lot about Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, Betty and Barney Hill. And some of these others are coming up, the Gleazy stars are coming up in the NASA lists of uh, suns that may have habitable planets. So we, we're dealing with a neighborhood here, and interestingly enough, most of the suns, I made these yellow just so they would stand out. Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, all of these are pretty, most of them are pretty, about 19, are in a yellow sun sequence, sort of similar to our own sun. Now, Jerry has, in 1966, a whole series of this kind of consciousness, beta consciousness, with the blonde, with beautiful aquamarine eyes, uh, skin that was uh, beigey brown, uh, usually always wearing a jumpsuit. And Jerry, with this strange life, starting out as an orphan, never feeling quite connected to much of anything, he starts feeling like this Zoe is, is really a good friend. And he said that Zoe would put him in this craft. He had these big hands, and his hands didn't exactly fit. But Zoe would show him how these weren't six-fingered, and they weren't four-fingered, they were five-fingered panels. This is a six-fingered 
panel from the Roswell region. Um, the idea being, in all these cases, that there is hand, mind, craft, craft, think of as being organic and reactive in its own self-activating software. You put the fingers inside of the panel that then connects your mind to the craft that is a sentient being and that that's how they fly. And that Jerry had this experience and found that he could do this. Now, this, these particular panels, for people who have heard that it was all a hoax and Ray Santilli in London hoaxed it all, I mean, that's counterintelligence at work. We know how that works. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I've seen the original interview with the original cameraman who was there in the tents, who took the photographs, all of this stuff uh, back a few years ago when I think uh, uh, Ray Santilli, I think, was here, or somebody was here with his film. But this was a site, just so you'll know, that between Aragon and Elk Mountain, at the western end of the Plains of San Augustine, that's where these panels were found, if you have not heard. But these were six-fingered, six-toed entities. These were autopsied at either Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, or the Naval Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland, and the man that I called uh, Stein uh, in myearthfiles.com news, and then uh, later he was uh, identified as anonymous at the citizens' hearing in 2013. Uh, back in 1998, I spent three days at his place and audio taped him. Uh, so that's where it started, the connection with who you may have known as Anonymous, and I know him by a completely other name, and was with his wife and his son. And he told me that working in 1956 to 60, he had uh, worked for the CIA, that's where his uh, real paycheck came, but that it, was, uh, it came through teaching cryptoanalysis in a base in the southeastern United States, where the Army had a cover for the CIA in uh, investigations of UFOs, ETs, and his boss was Langley, CIA, Washington, D.C. The extraterrestrial from Tau Ceti also showed Jerry Wills a four-foot black cube that holographically projected the Milky Way galaxy and other parts of the universe that showed different stars in different colors. As Zoe pointed out star systems, he telepathically told Jerry that people, homo sapien, or at least humanoid types on Earth did not originate on this planet, which you are beginning to hear in other sources, such as Tom DeLonge and other places where we're being introduced to the idea that this is a laboratory planet. Life has been mixed, matched, manipulated, and seeded on this planet for literally maybe a couple of billion years, but certainly the last half billion. Uh, this is also, you'll hear this in Corey Good and David Wilcock talking about uh, the issue of this particular solar system having territorial, uh, ancient territorial claims. <clears throat> In fact, they go so far to say that <clears throat> wherever you see a pyramid, <clears throat> wherever you see a pyramid, it is somebody's territorial claim in a war. Which is very interesting and for another presentation about what is actually what, it, what is the archaeology in Antarctica and Arctic? So, as Zoe pointed out star systems, he telepathically talked with Jerry in his head and showed him <coughs> symbols and images that humanoid DNA is from all over the universe. And all the way back then said to Jerry Wills, 
and it is beyond this dimension in other dimensions that the extraterrestrial Zoe telepath to Jerry Wills were like different frequencies of musical notes. Each dimension separate from others, but many dimensions together like a chord of music. Another teacher in Jerry's life was a Peruvian shaman named Pedro, who was familiar with the Lake Titicaca doorway of Aramamuru. Pedro did not speak English, but through an Aymara translator, Jerry learned from Pedro that the solid rock doorway was what the natives said was a two-way passage between worlds and dimensions. Pedro, told Jerry to kneel down and place his forehead in a small, shallow, indented place on the rock, on this smaller door, and then to chant a specific tone over and over. After getting the tone just right, Pedro said the doorway will open and the chanter will disappear into other realms. Also, Pedro had seen what he called ancient ones come through that doorway. Those beings were very tall, like Jerry, six feet, nine inches or taller. And those ancient ones were dressed in regal garments similar to Inca royalty. Pedro also knew that the tall ancient ones would kneel in front of the doorway as he was teaching Jerry and that they would start singing or making humming sounds with their forehead against the rock door exactly where he had Jerry put his forehead and that those ancient ones would suddenly disappear. Listening to Pedro, Jerry wanted very much to see and find out for himself and by November 1998, right after his marriage to Kathy, the couple traveled to Lake Titicaca in Peru. And at the Aramamuru doorway, Pedro taught Jerry how to make three different tones that were to always be kept secret. If Jerry could produce the tones correctly, he would go through that big rock doorway to where the ancient ones had come from. And Jerry described for me what happened on November 11th, 1998, at 11 p.m. in the night as he kneeled down before the rock doorway. Kathy was watching from a short distance away, and Jerry began to mimic the tones that Pedro had taught him. Suddenly, Jerry said it felt like he walked straight backwards off a cliff. Do that in your mind. You can almost feel your stomach spin. Hey, it feels like he walks backwards off a cliff. He has a sickening, falling feeling and then he began to see stars and galaxies passing by as if he were in a protected bubble moving through the cosmos. And now we can hear Jerry himself describe what happened next. And then it felt as though I was moving through something. I could sense that there was an impedance there. I squeezed my eyes closed because it was just so much pressure. It was hard to breathe. And then suddenly... I find myself on this floor, I guess it's a floor. It was just a big white, everything was white. You couldn't tell if there was a wall to the floor, to the ceiling, nothing. There wasn't any curvature, there wasn't any distinguishing aspect. Everything was equally luminous. It was just like in a big white cloud. Like I could stomp the floor and feel it under my foot. It felt like plastic. I decided to try to see if there were any acoustic properties. So I started whistling, high notes, low notes. It just was dead. So then I started hollering. You know, is anybody here? And it was just about second time that I hollered that there was this voice, and it was like it was coming over an intercom. And it was a man. And he sounded a little surprised. So I asked him, where am I? And he says, who are you? And so I said, well, I'm Jerry Wells. Where are you from? And I said, well, I was at the doorway at Armamuru. He says, I don't know what that is. I said, it's on the planet Earth in the Southern Hemisphere. And he says, oh, 
Earth. All right. I asked him what this place was. Where am I? Is this real? Am I really experiencing this? And he laughed, though it's very real. I understand your confusion. He said that I was on another world, that it was outside of my universe. So I wanted to understand how that's possible. And he says, well, there are many universes, and you've just passed from yours into ours. All right, so where is this universe? He said, it wouldn't do me any good to even try to explain it to you. I asked him how I'd gotten there. Well, apparently, these folks, whoever they are, had been very curious about the nature of the universe. In order to understand their universe, they tried to recreate, using what they knew, to recreate a model of the universe. But what had happened is that when they had recreated this, their creation had started to evolve. It had evolved up to a point to where it stopped growing. It was quite large. And that they had created another universe inadvertently. They weren't planning on doing this. And it had evolved. And it evolved quite rapidly. And I said, well, I don't understand this because we think the universe is billions and billions of years old. He says, well, where you are, you measure time much differently. Time is different in every universe. We've watched for the past, and he was struggling with terms that didn't make any sense to me. For him, it had been, let's say, a few decades. But within that universe that I had just come from, it was billions of years. Time was remarkably different for me than it was for him. He says, all right, you see that in the distance, probably 100 feet from me. He says, just walk towards that. It was this large, black, gelatinous-looking thing just floating in the air. You could see all these pinpoints of light. It was peppered with light and dark areas. And I said, what is this? And he says, that's the universe you came from. Well, this thing, it had these rods that were luminous, like neon. There was little beads of light moving through them, kind of like a fluorescent bulb, you know, overhead fluorescent that gets bad and has like little dark areas moving through it. I'm holding in my hand the illustration that you emailed to me. You are the figure in the foreground. Right, about 100 feet away from that thing. Did you get communication from the male voice about what the rods are doing with this gelatinous cosmic mass? Well, the rods were around its perimeter. didn't even look like they were connected to anything. And I said, these light rods, what's that? And he says, well, that holds it in place. It maintains the balance. And we think that's the reason why it stopped evolving. So did they deliberately try to stop the evolution of this universe? I think so. And when he was telling me about this, they were really very afraid that it was going to continue growing and it would just overwhelm them and then what would happen to them. So they're in another universe, and they created in this other universe a laboratory universe to test or learn something. And then their laboratory test universe took off somehow and created the universe that you and I and everything in our universe is? He had told me that they were trying to understand their place within their universe. And that what they had discovered is that they were inside of someone else's universe, just like we were inside of theirs. He says it's just layers and layers. There's very little that separates one from the other. And that's what they had learned. This 13.9 billion light year universe from our point of view is inside of the voice in the all white room universe and that universe is in another universe. It's like you're describing those Russian dolls that all fit inside of each other. It's just like Russian dolls. I said, what kind of machine would you use to do this? He tried to explain it. The closest thing that I can explain 
was what we call the Large Hadron Collider, a big thing over in Europe. This voice, he was talking about how they were colliding particles, and somehow a spark had occurred, and the spark didn't go away. Instead, it started growing. And as it grew, it started accumulating and creating more of itself on its own. He says, think of it maybe as a white hole. Think of it as a place where all of creation manifests itself within these torrents of energy that are moving both inward and outward simultaneously. If they were trying to experiment in a lab in another universe, trying to create the conditions in which universes come into being and evolve to settle something that they were trying to explore, then they would have to have set up conditions that would have set the rules in whatever universe they were trying to create to test. And it might explain why this universe is like on the edge of a razor blade in terms of the conditions that favor life as opposed to no life. They had learned that life had started to populate throughout that universe. They had made. Yeah, they were fascinated by this. Curious as can be how this was possible. And this doorway that I had gone through was something that they had put in place. They had these doorways throughout our universe in various places. They had been sending scientists in there to study the universe because this was a whole new realm of science for them to explore. And when they started discovering life in there, well, they were pretty shocked. Apparently, I'm not the only person who'd ever come through that doorway. And apparently, these doorways go to other places on this planet as well as to other planets. So maybe these folks that were coming through had figured out how to direct their travels. According to this voice I was talking to, there is a way to direct where you're going, but my only concern at that point was, how do I get back? Okay, is it possible that the beings that Pedro was referring to as a shaman would be the intelligence in this other universe in which we are nested, the other universe would come through to test their laboratory experiment, creating this universe that surprised them because it was evolving with life in it, Anything that was seen emerging from that doorway that you went through would be from the experimenters in the other universe that encompasses us. I think that that's very possible because, as I mentioned, time is much different there than it is here. And they might have been through and thinking that the Inca or whoever would have succeeded them were dressed in a certain way the last time they were through. So the next time they go through, they dress like that their royalty they can walk around wherever they want to go and no one's going to give them any grief but they're not royalty they're actually scientists from another universe yeah exactly that voice that i was talking to was telling me that part of their interest was that when they looked outward things just expanded out and out and out but there were things that were identical out there as there were deeper and deeper they looked into the smallest things, that it was always the same. It's the same if it was an atom versus a galaxy. They were trying to understand their place in the universe. What they didn't expect was to find that there was a universe that they were within and that there was a universe that they surrounded. It was quite an astonishing thing to have discovered for them. If they discovered that they were inside of another universe and that they had made a universe that they surrounded, then maybe even an infinite number of universes nest within each other. I think that's what the implication is, that there isn't an upper or lower limit. And what is the relationship now between their universe and this one? Oh, I haven't a clue. I could not understand his definition of time the only thing that I can figure is that the means of moving from one point to another was outside the dynamic of time altogether. That these doorways are instantaneous passageways to other places. You know, you can be somewhere for a while, go back through it, and arrive just shortly after you left. 
which is saying that there is time travel through these doorways that the other universe created in order to study this universe. When it comes to moving through these things, I don't know how time works. You know, it was the same situation when I was talking with Zoe. He was telling me that they could go from where they are to here and that it would be almost instantaneous. There really wasn't any time during the time of travel. Time stopped and then it restarted once you arrived. What are you left with now, the end of 2016, as a residue of that idea that we are in a simulated universe created by someone else? What it's left me with is a sense of awe. The thing that I find to be most remarkable is that at least between this universe and that one, there are beings who are aware of themselves and aware of their surroundings. But it is that spark of life that joins us, no matter what universe we're in. I know there's life out there among those stars. Somehow there's a veil. Somehow there's this barrier, this thing that I passed through twice. So this commonality of life, I find that to be awe-inspiring. No matter where you go, there's a spark of intelligence and a spark of life out there. And it can be quite good. Now, how many of you have heard about or read this book, The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot? It may be 25 people, I'm not sure, maybe 30. Well, The Holographic Universe was first released as a hardcover by HarperCollins in 1991. Uh, this uh, particular conference in the Lou Farish uh, era would have been two years old. And around that same time, I spoke at another Midwestern conference, along with human abduction researcher Bud Hopkins. And that new book by this young man who was only 38 years old at the time, and its mind-blowing hypothesis that our universe was being projected by something else, maybe from another dimension, was the topic of so many discussions at that conference in 1991. And a holographic universe, the way it is described by Michael Talbot, would be one where all of the information, all the zeros and ones for everything, from black holes to quarks, that makes up what we call three-dimensional reality, and you have to add time as another dimension, is actually contained in a two-dimensional surface that is projecting what we conscious creatures see and move through as three-dimensional space-time. And think about the cards that you might have, the credit cards, where they have the hologram now, and IDs. It's a flat surface, but when you have the light, when light hits it in just the right way, it projects outward. Well, after that conference, Bud and I had the same airline flight back east to New York and Philadelphia, where I lived at the time. Bud and I sat next to each other to talk about some new abduction cases, and he surprised me when he said, quote, Linda, I'll tell you something confidentially. Michael Talbot has been one of my UFO abduction cases. But he doesn't want anyone to know that because he is afraid that if people knew the truth, they might not read his book. And Michael told me the truth is that the entire universe, the entire holographic universe in his book concept that he has written about was given to him in telepathic downloads by the extraterrestrials who have been abducting him. Close quote. Now, sadly, Michael Talbot died one year later at age 39 from lymphocytic leukemia. And then Bud Hopkins died in 2011. And now it's 2017. And as an increasing number of scientific papers and headlines are asking that question, are we living in a holographic universe created by a computer simulation? 
I think it is okay now to say that Michael Talbot's abduction secret that he went to his grave with is that his 1990 book, The Holographic Universe, that you will, I hope, read if you haven't read, is consistent with what more and more scientists are trying to figure out if this is a computer simulated universe. The book and now have come to the same place. Two months ago, on January 30th, 2017, theoretical physicists and astrophysicists from the University of Southampton in the UK and the University of Waterloo in Canada and the University of Salento in Italy published in Physical Review Letters, quote, substantial evidence, that's very unusual for physicists, substantial evidence, close quote, that we are living in a holographic universe. And that is exactly what Michael Talbot was experiencing in the 1980s with other intelligences and ended up working with Bud Hopkins and then finally uh, released the book, The Holographic Universe in 1991. Now here is an illustration that the physicists used in their new paper formally entitled From Planck Data to Planck Era Observational Tests of Holographic Cosmology. This is now, this is current physics. Time runs from left to right. The beginning is deliberately fuzzy and continues becoming clearer and clearer because the scientists think that at the true beginning of this universe, that that is the beginning of the holographic phase and that everything was in a mix of coming into what we would call uh, rule sets. So those first two gray ovals are small and blurry to illustrate their contention that space and time were not yet well defined. And then by the third oval of grays, whites, and blacks in here, the universe enters what the scientists call a geometric phase, which can then be described by mathematical equations such as Einstein's general relativity from the early 20th century. And studying our universe's cosmic microwave background is what they have been doing that was left over from the singularity that was the big burst that, who knows, might have been that spark in the other dimension that Jerry Wills was being told about. And our universe erupts in this big bang. Well, today, the scientists can detect large amounts of data embedded in that white noise or those microwaves left over from that moment that the universe exploded into this dimension and kept growing. And studying that data in the cosmic microwave background, these modern Earth scientists were able to compare networks of features in the data to modern quantum field theory. And they found that some of the simplest quantum field theories can explain nearly all cosmological observations of this early universe. So in their new paper, they conclude that about 375,000 years after the universe's geometric phase in the third oval of this illustration, they begin to see what they call imprints of information about the very early universe. And the scientists hypothesize that when the development of star and galaxy structure began to evolve up to what we call the current time, is this is what we see and that they are penetrating with their study of the microwave back further and further and finding zeros and ones essentially imprinted in the fabric, the very fabric of this cosmos. Now there is a Professor Costa Skenderas of mathematical sciences at the University of Southampton in England and he says, quote, Holography is a huge leap forward in the way we think about the structure and creation of the universe. 
Einstein's theory of general relativity explains almost everything large scale in the universe, but starts to unravel when examining its origins and mechanisms at the quantum levels. Scientists have been working for decades to combine Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum theory, and some people believe the concept of a holographic universe has the potential for the first time to reconcile the two. And imagine that everything you see, feel, and hear in three dimensions plus time, in fact, emanates from another dimension flat in a flat two-dimensional projection that creates this three dimension. The idea is similar to that of ordinary holograms where a three-dimensional image, like think Disney World, is encoded in a two-dimensional surface. And however, this time, it's not the beautiful figures dancing to our eyes and mind on a floor at Disney World. And they, it seems so miraculous. And remember, the projector in the holograms can never be in the same place. The projector is always in another room. Projecting the holograms. But this time, what we're talking about is it's our entire universe that is encoded and being projected. So now we're back to that panel discussion a year ago in New York. Is this a computer simulated universe? Well, this physicist says enthusiastically, yes, we are in a computer simulated universe. Tom Campbell, born December 9, 1944, says he has now done more than 400 YouTube videos on that very question. Tom likes to call himself an applied physicist because he never finished his PhD in experimental nuclear physics at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. He broke off from his university work to be a systems analyst with the Army Technical Intelligence in the Foreign Science and Technology Center also in Charlottesville, Virginia. That is now called the National Ground Intelligence Center. In 1972, he worked for Robert Monroe, the author of the 1971 groundbreaking book, Journeys Out of the Body. Tom Campbell helped Robert Monroe develop the hemi-sync technology for teaching how to go out of body, which Monroe would use in his formal Monroe Institute, finally established as a laboratory to study consciousness. Later, Tom Campbell worked for the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, in a group called Space and Missile Defense Agency from 1983 to the mid-1990s. And then Tom Campbell retired from government assignments. But he has never stopped working on his conviction that this is a simulated universe by something projecting information from another dimension that caused the original digital Big Bang. Tom is a co-author on a brand new paper soon to be published this year entitled On Testing the Simulation Hypothesis. His colleagues are Caltech mathematician Uman Owadi in Pasadena. I got to spend uh, 12 hours with this mathematician uh, in February uh, with another person and it was discussing all of this and it was incredible. His colleagues are Caltech mathematician uh, and physicist Joe Savageau from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, also in Pasadena, and David Watkinson, who produces digital animation of virtual reality simulations in Hollywood. Tom Campbell's concept behind this new simulation paper is that our entire universe was simulated by some intelligence to be what he calls an entropy reduction trainer for souls. Now, right before we hear Tom Campbell discuss this, for those of you who may not have dealt with entropy as a concept before, it usually refers to the idea that everything in this universe keeps moving from order to disorder, losing energy along the way. And this is why in this universe, we can take a glass and we can throw it against a wall and it will shatter. 
In a universe where entropy may not dominate, who knows what might happen, but it might not be possible to break a glass. In our universe, the second law of thermodynamics says entropy always increases in this universe. And that happens as energy is transferred or transformed and more and more energy is wasted and so there is a natural tendency of any isolated system to de do degenerate into a more disordered state. The bottom line of the second law of thermodynamics is you can't unscramble a broken egg. So what do we do? We keep eggs in cartons to help sustain order that protects the eggs until you need them. Sustaining order is an example of what physicist Tom Campbell calls entropy reduction. He thinks that the challenge for souls in this universe is to learn how to reduce entropy, which means counteracting disorder and moving toward more order, love, and cherishing life instead of disorder, hate, and killing life. Tom Campbell also thinks that what we humans experience in this universe as hard physical matter is an illusion, that there really is no hard physicality to this universe if we truly understood that the big mysterious computer generating everything is consciousness from another dimension, dreaming this dream we call our universe. And for Tom Campbell, this dream does not even need holography to explain this simulated universe. Tom says in his three volume book, My Big Toe, The Theory of Everything, that's a physicist's inside joke. It was published in February of 2003. And Toe, or The Theory of Everything, that all there is for Tom Campbell is computer code computing our reality to be a trainer for souls. Well, if this is a simulation, who's in charge? Right. Who's the programmer? Where is it simulated from? Questions about this being not the reality, but a subset of something bigger. And what is this bigger thing? It brings up all of those metaphysical questions now that suddenly have scientific rigor. If scientific rigor says this is a virtual reality, then it cannot be computed from inside this virtual reality. It has to be computed from elsewhere, from another reality frame. It's computer code that's computing our reality. If we are living in a computer simulated universe and the projector is outside in another dimension, is the computer projector god of this simulated universe? Okay, no, the computer is not god. The projector is not god. The player is not god. They're just pieces of this larger consciousness system. So if you have a religious bent, then the individual units of consciousness are souls, and the larger consciousness is god, the source of everything else. Well, where does that come from? I only have two assumptions for my theory. The rest is logic. One is that consciousness exists, and the other is that evolution exists. Evolution just being a process of selection, the things that work go on, and things that don't work don't. Where did the prime consciousness come from? It created itself. What is reincarnation, the recycling of souls in all of this? Well, you start with understanding our purpose here. We are individuated units of consciousness. Our goal is to decrease the entropy of our consciousness. That's so us and our system can continue to evolve. So to create a virtual reality where you can get feedback, where there's consequences. In a tight rule set, virtual reality like ours, everything has consequences. So you get in this entropy reduction trainer we call our universe, and you make choices, and by those choices, you tend to reduce your entropy or grow your entropy. If you reduce your entropy, you're evolving going forward, and the system then does too, because you're a part of it. So that's your purpose. The whole system wants to constantly work to keep its entropy low so it can continue to exist. 
Now, it turns out that in the social system of all these individuated units of consciousness, the way you create more information is by cooperation, caring, working with each other, helping each other. I call that the love side. The way that you increase entropy or de-evolve is through non-cooperation. It's all about me. I'm going to take mine, or and I'll take some of yours too if I can get it and keep it. That then creates entropy and is de-evolutionary. So we're making choices here, trying to grow up to become love, to become caring, to become cooperative. That's our mission here. So we're consciousness, making choices, we're trying to evolve, which means move us more toward becoming love. So that's what we do. Now, you can't do that in a one shot. It doesn't work. All comes and goes. You take what you did last time and you start with that and you add to it. Learning is that way. Learning is cumulative. You can't just, at three years old, take calculus. It won't work. You've got to start with arithmetic. So in order to learn, it has to be a cumulative process. So you accumulate through lifetimes and you grow. Every time you go through a lifetime, you decrease your entropy if you're successful a little bit. Or if you increase it, you de-evolve a little bit. The next time, you get to start where you stopped last time. And that's why we go through these cycles, keeping our system viable and ourselves viable, and our mission is to become love. That's where we're headed. There is potential irony here that the physicists of this planet will be the ones that corroborate Christ and the golden rule of love and do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Absolutely. That was one of the big, aha, uh -huh, kind of strange things that I didn't expect. I'm a physicist, so I'm working at this idea of consciousness, trying to understand it. And when I finally kind of figure it out and I realize that, a lot of the things that are in religious philosophy are actually true. You know, these are, the, these are people who actually have seen the nature of our reality and how it works. And as they understood it, they had to put it into terminology that suited their times and the other people. You have to communicate in a language that they understand. Do you think that the yin and yang symbol is a metaphor for a universe of entropy in which everything is winding down and that the dark versus the light seem to always be in conflict? The dark and the light always in conflict? Yes. And the reason for that is that's the nature of free will. The reason we have good versus evil is our theme in everything. Movies, literature, good versus evil, because that is the key thing. That's what we're doing here. We're trying to evolve in the positive direction. That's love. That's positive. We have those that can make an opposite choice. They have free will. They can choose to be self-centered. So the reason you have evil is because there's free will, not because there has to be an equal amount of it. Now, there is this struggle between the two because they're going in opposite directions. The negative part, ones that are de-evolving, they love and enjoy chaos. Those of us that are trying to work in the opposite direction, we're trying to work against that because that's the nature of evolution. It just keeps chugging. The stuff that works goes on. The stuff that doesn't work eventually self-destructs. That's the nature of our reality frame. And there are all kinds of contradictions and areas that I know that it run through people's mind, but at least uh, you've been exposed to the thinking of somebody who has perhaps been in another dimension and a physicist who is actively working with people at Caltech on papers that are going to try to test are we living in a simulated universe. And this takes me back to Michael Talbot's The Holographic Universe. And while Michael Talbot was according to Bud, receiving this information about our universe from an alien intelligence. A brilliant physicist, David Bohm, released in a groundbreaking book in 1980 called Wholeness and the Implicate Order. If you have not read this book, I urge you to. It is extremely profound. Bohm explained that implicate means an ever-present hidden order, that we're 
we have not been living on this planet understanding the hidden order that is enfolded into all objects and appearances of this universe from subatomic particles to huge galaxies. And Bohm also concluded, quote, all mass is frozen light. All mass is frozen light. Recognizing in physicist David Bohm's work the same concepts that the alien intelligence downloaded to him, Michael Talbot wrote, quote, one of Bohm's most startling assertions is that the tangible reality of our everyday lives is really a kind of illusion like a holographic image. Underlying it is a deeper order of existence, a vast and more primary level of reality that gives birth to all the objects and appearances of our physical world in much the same way that a piece of holographic film gives birth to a hologram. Bohm calls this deeper level of reality the implicate order, which means enfolded. And he refers to our own level of existence, like in the room, as the ex order, which is unfolded from that which is hidden to the out. Put another way, Talbot said, quote, electrons and all other particles are no more real or permanent than the form that a geyser of water takes as it gushes out of a fountain. Think about it. You're seeing a shape. But the shape is only water. And the water is only going into a shape because of some sort of a rule set that is at the base of the fountain. So for physicist David Bohm, subatomic particles are sustained by a constant influx from the implicate, the hidden order, the underlying computer code that is enfolded in everything that there is. Zeros and ones are the mathematical language of our universe enfolded in that implicate order. And in a piece of holographic film, the film is in an implicate order because the image encoded in its interference patterns is hidden, enfolded throughout the film. The hologram projected from the film is an explicate order because it represents the unfolding of the enfolded image and only one thing can do it, light. The constant and flowing exchange between the two orders explains how particles, such as the electron, can shapeshift from one kind of particle to another. Say an electron enfolds back into the implicate order, while another, let's say a photon, unfolds and takes the electron's place. That would also explain how a quantum photon can be either a particle or a wave. But it is the consciousness of a player in the cosmic computer simulation that interacts with all the implicate possibilities and determines what unfolds and what remains hidden. All of the constant moment by moment unfoldings and enfoldings are why physicist Bohm referred to our entire universe as a hollow movement instead of a hologram. Now, which simulation hypothesis might be true? The holographic universe? Tom Campbell's information and consciousness is all that there is universe? Or something else incomprehensible to us homo sapiens? One incomprehensible insight came to a male abductee, a friend of mine still, who was working with abduction investigator Bud Hopkins in New York City, and I'll call this abductee Paul. He was the successful owner and manager of his own water quality laboratory in New Jersey. It was his 32nd birthday with his parents, his sister, and her husband, and they had gone into New York City to celebrate over dinner. Around midnight, they were coming out of the city onto the I-95 freeway going south. Paul's father was driving the car, Paul was in the front passenger seat. In the back were his mom, sister, and her husband. Paul's father asked, well, when did they build a restaurant on a tower? 
and he was pointing to a round group of lights in the sky. Paul, the analytical scientist, said, Dad, that isn't a restaurant on a tower. That's something in the sky. So Paul's father pulled over to the side of the freeway not far out of New York, and now they are all looking and arguing about what the round lighted thing is in the sky. Suddenly, Paul said he felt a physical sensation of splitting into two with one part going forward up and through the front windshield. And as that part rose, he wanted to see the car and immediately his rising self could look down and see his father unmoving behind the steering wheel and he could see his own body, his own unmoving body in the passenger seat. As his out-of-body self continued to rise upward, Paul saw this red blinking light and headed for it. The red light was above a large donut-shaped craft, and Paul felt pulled downward into the middle of the donut. And then he could see several gray-skinned beings with big black slanted eyes standing in a circle, all looking up at him as he was coming down. He became terrified, and he began screaming trying to paddle his legs as if he were swimming to reverse course and go back up. But Paul ended up standing right in the middle of the gray beings. And then in a jump cut, his memory is lying on a table, and to his right, extending out of dark shadows, is a gray-skinned hand with four long, skinny fingers wrapped around a silver instrument that Paul compared to an electric toothbrush but it had a sky blue light shining out of the end that was approaching Paul's chest. Paul was a practicing Buddhist and he believed in mind over matter. So he concentrated very hard on his arm muscles and said to me that he managed, his arms were down and he managed suddenly with this burst of energy, I will do this. And his hands came like this. And he said the being's hand never stopped. And that he then, to his un incomprehensible horror, found his own hands doing this on his own body. And then the hand and the light hit him right in the middle of his hands. And he said that it felt like when you touch an electric wire or an electric fence. Then, the next scene Paul remembers is being in a room where there was a large three-dimensional screen of stars and galaxies. A gray being takes Paul to look at a screen. He said it was three-dimensional, what we would call today a hologram. And in the hologram and this three-dimensional, there are points of light and then there is a pattern. It comes two, 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 two. And the ET points to one of these and says, explaining telepathically to Paul, that we, he, we are looking, they are looking at 10 universes, paired five pairs. And the being points at one and says, you are one of the universes of these 10 in these five pairs. And the being then says, here's your universe and the one right next to it is exactly the opposite of your universe. And the gray being then telepaths to Paul at that moment that at biological death in this universe, our soul spirit enters a tunnel zone to change charge from this universe to go into the universe next door, the pairs. And the way Paul explained it was that negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons in the universe 
here would change to positively charged electrons and negatively charged protons in the next door universe in order for the soul spirit to enter the other opposite universe. Paul said the 3D screen changed from five pair of universes into the universe that was identified by the gray as being the opposite of ours. And then he said what he saw was a cosmic sky that was white with black dots of stars and galaxy shapes. And that he was shown planets and that the colors were vibrant, iridescent, that they glowed in shades that he had never seen before. And the gray showed Paul that electrons there were oppositely charged from this universe and protons, everything was negative. And that the vector of time in that opposite universe goes to the past. No entropy there, where nothing deteriorates, nothing ages or could be broken. And Paul said the Eben touched the three-dimensional screen and the ten paired universes reappeared and the Eben pointed and said, when your body containers in your current universe die, they pass through a dark tunnel to change charge before they enter the white light brightness of the universe paired with yours that is completely the opposite of your universe. Your universe where time moves to the future is ruled by entropy where everything loses energy and dies. The other paired universe is ruled by non-entropy where time moves to the past and everything evolves to young and fresh and nothing dies. The Eben made a motion with its long gray finger from our universe in the 3D screen to the opposite universe paired with ours. And Paul told me the finger motion was like the Eben was tracing the infinity symbol. And Paul also saw scenes in his mind's eye of an elderly human soul in this universe enter the tunnel to change charge and enter a container body in the next door universe. And then that body got younger and younger and passed back through the tunnel to change charge before it was born in this universe. This reminds me, this pattern carved in stone, it reminds me of Paul's experience this is nearly 4,000-year-old spiral labyrinth carved in stone near Cornwall in the UK. It is said to represent the cyclic renewal of life, the great round of death and rebirth, the journey of the soul in and out of past, present, and future. These labyrinths have been found carved on ancient rocks in England, Ireland, the Adriatic Sea region, Hopi Indian lands, Greece, and the island of Crete, and some date to at least 4,000 years before Christ. And physicist David Bohm might have said that these stone spirals could represent the cycle between universes and dimensions related to the pulse, a pulse, between wave and particle of light. The pulse between wave and particle of light could be the fundamental foundation and explanation for everything. In the 1986 book, Dialogues with Scientists and Sages, Bohm says this in an interview. He's, he's passed, but I think of him as this enormous mind still. Quote, Mass is a phenomenon of connecting light rays which go back and forth, sort of freezing them into a pattern. So matter, as it were, is condensed or frozen light. Light is not merely electromagnetic waves, but in a sense, other kinds of waves that go at that speed. 
Therefore, all matter is a condensation of light into patterns moving back and forth at average speeds, which are less than the speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. Even Einstein had some hint of that idea. You could say that when we come to light, we are coming to the fundamental activity in which existence has its ground. You could add consciousness has its ground, or is at least coming close to it. Close quote. My father loved light. My father always said God was the breeze and sun and cold water coming out of the hose when he washed the car. And my mother said all life was precious and always carried bugs and spiders out of the house in dust rags. Those two philosophies were as close as our family ever got to religion. When I was 21, I went on a camping trip with my younger brother and cousin into the remote Salmon River country of Idaho. Each day to explore and exercise, I hiked up a mountain near our campsite. And late one afternoon, as I was walking back down, I saw orangish gold shafts of light shining through these thick stands of lodgepole pine. The sun was setting in the low angle cast beams that shimmered with forest dust. And I was stunned by the beauty as if I had never seen light before. And I began to walk toward those rays. And I remember how my legs and my arms, they were moving, but something changed as if I were in motion picture film that suddenly switched from normal speed to very, very, very slow motion. My next memory is being further down the mountain and near my feet was a small blooming wildflower. The petals were pulsing with an intense white light edged with an orchid glow. I was confused and I wanted everything to go back to normal and I began to run. And when I stopped, the pulsing light had spread to all of the blooming wildflowers as far as I could see. And behind me, the mountain was a dark shadow with the setting sun to its back. And in the silhouette, it seemed to be moving slowly up and down against the twilight sky as if the mountain itself were breathing. And a few first stars pulsated with this same orchid white light that was shining from the wildflowers. And then, as if an unseen force gently took hold of my arms, it felt like warm jello pushed my skin up. And I heard this thought voice that's been with me now most of my life. You are one with the light. The light is one with you. And you are in the hands of God forever. And then the flower stars and the mountain stop pulsing. And below me, in the distance near the river, I could see a fire. And there was life. My brother and my cousins were starting a fire to make dinner. But it was as though someone had lifted up the surface around me for a while to let me see what was really underneath. Since then, I have been convinced that a common source of energy pervades all there is and all that can be an ally to living life. It can be an ally to living life. That energy, I think, moves in cycles, like the spiral on this carved rock. Part of the old symbol's meaning is that the machinery of the universe involves the evolution of souls. The spirals are not static, and they are not two-dimensional. The symbol is a slice. A larger reality can be imagined as a spiral upward and downward through innumerable other frequencies or dimensions. So then when we see these carvings all over this planet, we are looking at a slice through the true reality of frequencies above and frequencies below. Ancient wisdom understood that the moment of death 
was simply a transition into another frequency on the spiral. So all lines in all directions are simultaneous and filled with life forms ebbing and flowing, supported by a singular force, an invisible matrix of energy from which everything emerges and of which everything returns. Thank you, Eureka Springs. Thank you.